Hello and welcome to a new series of videos about one of the most important challenges in mathematics. The idea is to take us from some of the simplest ideas like prime numbers and to gently build up our knowledge and understanding of both the techniques that are useful and some of the interesting ideas and theorems along the way as we reach the foothills of the Riemann hypothesis. We're not going to solve it, but we will hopefully start to appreciate some of the really interesting features of both prime numbers and the Riemann hypothesis. It'll be an interesting journey, you know, through history um, as well as through mathematics. And the focus really is on accessibility, keeping things simple and friendly so that we can all start to appreciate one of the most important and probably one of the most difficult open challenges in mathematics. Um, it's a way for us to learn together. Um, you don't need to be an expert mathematician. You need some school basics, um, but we will try to kind of bring everyone along. Uh, we might make an error, um, so please do get back to me if you think we've kind of got something wrong. But the point is that we're learning together. The reason for doing this series is because many of the kind of guides and books out there have a really high barrier to entry. They're not that accessible. Um, so this is really a challenge to ourselves to see if we can crack open some of the really interesting mathematics and some of the surprising results and see if we can, you know, appreciate and understand them without being, um, you know, uh, 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 having a training or a background uh, at university level. So we expect um, a basic kind of understanding, which will be something like, you know, um, secondary school, you know, 18 year old school mathematics. Um, you might call that A-levels in the UK. So in this first video, we're just going to explore and understand you know, the, the, what is a prime number. Um, so before we start, I um, just want to introduce these characters. Um, on the left is Euclid um, from, from ancient Greece. Um, we also have um, Euler and Gauss and Riemann himself. Um, there are other mathematicians, but these are the ones that have played quite a significant role, I think, in in understanding numbers um, and, and, and prime numbers and number theory. So today we're just going to introduce um, just the idea of a number and 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 look at you know what is a what is a prime number. It's it's the basis of all you know the it's the centre of all of our future discussions. So we should try and understand it a little bit. So what is a prime number? Well, let's start at the very very basics. Um, you couldn't get simpler than this. The counting numbers: one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and so on. Um, and it's what we use to count things like apples in a box or um, the, um, you know, the number of um, sweets I might have on my desk. So these are, these are you might um, have heard the word integers, um, but we can just call them whole numbers or counting numbers. Now we can add them. Again, that's a very simple thing that we learned how to do when we were very young. Um, and then we learn to multiply them. So here's just two very simple examples. Two times four is eight. That's not, not difficult at all. Five times five is 25. Again, we probably did lots of this when we were young and maybe even got bored of doing it. When we look more closely at um, an example like three times four is 12, Let's, let's introduce some um, terminology. We'll try and avoid too much jargon, but there's some that, are, that, that we just can't avoid. So when we look at this example here, three times four is 12. Three and four are called factors, and 12 is a product. Now that terminology shouldn't surprise you. You probably come across it, but if you haven't, that's what these terms mean. So three times four is 12, 12 is the product, three and four are factors of 12. If you're thinking ahead, you might say, well, six and two are factors of 12, and that would be correct. Six times two is 12, so six and two are factors of 12. 
easy peasy so far, not, not too difficult. Now let's make an observation that's um, kind of important. So if we have two numbers A and B multiplying together to give C, A and B are the factors and C is the product. Now this might sound really obvious, but it is important. If A and B are whole numbers, so is C. Now that's kind of almost too obvious to see, um, but it's, it's, it's something that we'll kind of make use of um, later. Um, so I just wanted to kind of highlight this really obvious point because it will be used um, later. So if we multiply two whole numbers, just like if we add two whole numbers, the result is a whole number. So three times four is 12 and 12 is a whole number. It's not 12.5 or 12.1. So let's, let's get interesting now. Let's ask an interesting question, perhaps an innocent question. If A and B can be any counting number we feel like choosing, you know, A can be three and B can be four, you know, seven, 12, you know, any two whole numbers. We, we have kind of freedom to do that. But does, does the result, the product, does that also have the same freedom? Now, what do I mean by that? Let's, let's kind of write that out in pen and paper. So I can think of a number and can multiply it by another number to give a product. So I can say three, let's pick another number, four is 12. This has complete freedom. I can choose anything. This has complete freedom, I can choose anything. But does this have complete freedom to be any number? What do I mean by that? Well, let's reverse it. Let's say if we wanted um, 16, can I think of numbers, factors that multiply together to give 16? If I wasn't minded in the mood for 16, I might say, no, I don't want 16, I want 17. Can I have the freedom to choose 17? So does something times something equals 17? That's, that's what we're saying. Is there complete freedom to choose a product? Let's look into that a little bit more. So here's an example, because so we're taking this very slowly to start with. A and B so we want to start with 12. We want the freedom to choose 12 as the product. So A is three and B is four. That works. Those are solutions to this problem. It's not the only solution, actually. We can have two and six. That works as well. So we did have the freedom to choose 12. Let's pick another number, 100. We want the freedom to choose 100. Yes, we can make that work. We can say two times 50 is 100. Great. Somebody else might say, actually 10 times 10 is 100. Great, that works too. What about seven? Do we have the freedom to choose seven? And what you'll find is you can try different combinations. In fact, you can try all the combinations of the numbers below seven, and there won't be any combination that works Two times three is six, not seven. Two times four is eight, not seven. Three times three is nine, not seven. In fact, you won't find any, there's no solutions. So we don't have complete freedom to pick any product. There are some products that, there are some numbers that can't be a product. That's odd, isn't it? So we've not done any fancy complicated maths. All we've done is asked very simple questions about very simple multiplication that we've been doing since we were under the age of 10 probably. But it's interesting that we found some numbers that can't be a product. Let's try another one. Here's 11. 5 times 2 is 10, not 11. 5 times 3 is 15. Let's try, I don't know, 3 times 4, that's 12. 3 times 3, 9. You can try all different combinations um, and you won't find an answer that gives a whole number times a whole number is 11. So we call these uh, elusive numbers, these kind of special numbers, we call them prime numbers. 
And the definition is that they don't have whole number factors. Simple. You can look up a more formal and correct definition, but that's, that's fine to go with at this stage. And here are some more prime numbers. 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, and so on. Um, there's quite a few there, and the list, you know, I'm sure we can find more of them. But if we pick one, say 19 or 23 or 31, we can't find two numbers that multiply to give them. So these are prime numbers. But you might be thinking, hang on, what about 1? One? 1 times 7 is 7. 1 times 7 is 7, that's correct, we're not going mad. <laughs> um, but we're going to exclude 1 as a legitimate factor for the purposes of primes. Um, if we didn't do that, then there wouldn't be any prime numbers, because every number would have a factor of 1. Um, if you think of it, you know, 11 or, or 5, you know, 1 times 5 is 5. Um, so it's not useful. Um, it, it's useful to exclude 1 as a factor. So if you do look up the formal definition of a prime, it'll say that a prime can't be, has no factors other than 1 and itself. That's just a slightly more complicated way of saying what we're saying here. In fact, um, if we did include one, it would get worse, the, the, the problem. <laughs> so to illustrate that, have a look at this. We've got 12 is 3 times 4, but 12 is also 3 times 4 times 1, which is also, 12 is also 3 times 4 times 1 times 1 times 1 times 1. In fact, we can have an infinite number of ones. So that makes it really messy and, and, and difficult to kind of keep things kind of simple um, and neat. So that's another reason uh, for excluding one. Um, we'll actually look at this idea of uniqueness of these products, um, uniqueness of these factors later, but don't worry about that today. Today we're keeping it simple. So one is excluded. And if you're really feeling enthusiastic, you might say, well, what about negative primes? Why do they have to be whole numbers? And they could. I mean, we can invent a system of mathematics uh, which does have negative primes, um, but we don't gain too much by doing that. Um, and history is also an interesting perspective on this. Prime numbers were known about and kind of discussed and talked about and agreed uh, in ancient times well before the idea of a negative number. So negative numbers were controversial and it was quite late in human history that we kind of grudgingly, begrudgingly accepted them. <laughs> um, so primes predated uh, consensus around negative numbers. Um, so the mathematics that has developed from primes is older than the concept of a negative number. And we've just gone with it. Um, if you know more about mathematics, you'll know that actually we don't gain too much. We're not losing a lot by sticking with the positive numbers. Now, when we look at these primes, um, there doesn't seem to be a pattern to them. Um, there's an obvious one, which is they're all odd numbers, because if they were even numbers, we could divide them by two. So all even numbers can be divided by two, which means they have a factor. So all these primes are odd numbers, but apart from that, it's hard to see a pattern. Um, can we predict what the next one's going to be? Can we look at these numbers like 2, 3, 5, 7 um, and using using those observations predict what the next one's going to be? Can I predict, for example, what the hundredth prime is going to be or the thousandth or the millionth? Um, that's not easy. Um, and that's part of the real challenge about primes is that they appear to be kind of random. Now clearly they're not random because we know where the next prime is, you know, we can list them and test them and work them out. So they're not actually random, but they appear random in the sense that it's difficult to find a predictive pattern. Um, you know, if we had a list of even numbers, let me let me draw that out. So if I had a list of numbers like this, 2, 4, 6, 
8, 10. You can see the pattern and you know you can say the next one is 12, 14. So the nth even number is 2n. So that's 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 something we, we probably have looked at before. If you're looking at odd numbers, 1, 3, 5, 7 and so on, it's 2n plus or minus 1, minus 1 in this case. Um, and that that's, that's the pattern that generates the odd numbers. We can look at another one, um, say the triangle numbers. So the triangle numbers are the ones that kind of build up to make a triangle. So the first one is 1, the next one is 2, the next one is, sorry, 3, because it's that. And then the next one is those, which is 1, 2, 6, and then 10. And the next one should be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 15. And you may or may not know that the nth triangle number is that. So there is a pattern, and this formula captures that pattern. Now, is there a pat is there a simple formula that captures the pattern that predicts that gives us the nth prime? That's the question. That's the really important question, um, and it's rather um, deep and hard. And we're going to explore some of the issues that emerge over the coming kind of videos. So just to conclude there, to say there doesn't appear to be a pattern in the primes, um, so it's hard to predict the next prime. And that's, that challenge has fascinated mathematicians because the definition of a prime is so easy that a, a young school child under the age of 10 can understand what a prime number is. And yet being able to find a pattern in the primes has challenged um, and maddened <laughs> mathematicians for hundreds and hundreds of years, centuries. Great, so we'll stop there um, for the first video. Um, we've just introduced the idea of primes um, and in the coming videos we'll look at more interesting things and I think in the next one we'll ask ourselves the question of how many prime numbers are there. That'll be interesting. Bye.